Hello everyone, I'm Eddie Pleasant, and yes, this is my choir shirt from my years in the LHS Chorale. Welcome to the finale of the LHS Encore Virtual Concert Series, sponsored by the LHS Encore, the Alumni Chorale of Midland Lee High School. Encore's mission is to present an annual concert to fund the LHS Alumni Chorale Music Scholarship that will be awarded to graduating seniors of the Lee Chorale and or graduated Lee Chorale members who pursue the study of music at the college and university level. We thank you for your support and your encouragement throughout this series. Links to this and all the installments will be available through the LHS Encore Facebook page and the other LHS Facebook Chorale Alum Directors groups. Those links will lead you to YouTube. So feel free to share the links with family and friends. And please don't forget to donate to the LHS Alumni Chorale Scholarship. She is one of the best known and loved mezzo-sopranos in the world of opera today. She's a singer's singer who has performed in the most prestigious venues here and abroad. She sung for royalty and heads of state. She is my first leading lady, my dear friend for many, many years, and a credit to her family, her teachers, and the communities that formed her as a person and as a musician. With all that she has done and continues to do, she is still one of us. Here now excerpts from my recent conversation with Susan Graham. Later, we will hear a piece Susie submitted for our enjoyment, courtesy of LA Opera. <laughs> Come on, Susan. <laughs> that is one of the best introductions I've ever had. You and know, by the way, I wore my dressy mask just for yeah, you. But I guess right. I don't have to because sadly we're not in the same room. So that's right. So all right, fine. That. okay, beautiful. Yes, ma'am, with that beautiful bob. It's so funny because you know, when you do these sort of reunion things, it's like, oh my gosh, I haven't seen you since high school. But that's right. that's not even true with us because no. we've been great friends ever since. You were in ninth grade. Yes, exactly. A hundred years ago, a hundred, close to a hundred years back ago. Back in the 1900s. And you know, we yeah. did shows together in college. Yeah, and and we have like, run into each other, uh, you know, in the oddest places and the best all over places. the world. And it's it's been you know Salzburg and 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 it's nothing for you to finish a. Um, uh, a performance at the Met, and I'll go backstage and you know, you know, chew the fat and meet some people, um, and then you know, walk you home. You know, and, and mm -hmm. we're walking the streets of New York just like we were just walking down Wadley in Midland or something. To, you know, coming to <laughs> Jakey's Pizza. You know, like like we walk down Wadley in Midland so often. Yeah, Everybody right. walks down yeah. Wadley. Nobody, nobody, <laughs> I, nobody walks in Midland. Come on, give me a break. Yeah. I know it. That's yeah, fun. when you hang out with Susie, ain't no telling who you're going to run into, you know. Do you remember one time you came to a performance at the Met and you ended up taking pictures of me and Hugh Jackman? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember One that. of my most cherished photos, may well, I say. I, I, I know. You. and I, I, see that, I see that picture and you hardly ever give me a photo credit, by the way, but that's all right. I'm, yeah, our okay, lawyers, I our promise lawyers from now on. But, but yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm not, you know, I'm not that starstruck by people, you know, uh, and so I always think that I have a presence of mind. And fortunately, well, I went back to see you backstage and you said, Eddie, would you look out there to see if Hugh Jackman is out there waiting? And I went, what? You said, Hugh Jackman, I, I met him on a plane. We were going to Japan or somewhere. Japan, uh-huh. And and you said that you had invited him to come see an opera because he had never been to an opera, right? That's not true. He hadn't been to see Rosen Cavalier at the Met, he and I was doing Rosen that Cavalier particular, at the Met. That particular yeah. opera. Okay. So I went out to that, you know, outside of the dressing room area and uh -huh. looked down the hall towards all of those long li list of people, line of people, and there is Hugh Jackman 
in a three-piece suit in a beautiful Saville row three-piece suit that I wanted to rip off of his body because we're about the same size except I have really long ape arms and he has like model arms you're a lot taller than he is and and uh anyway uh he was just leaning up against the wall like nobody's business and nobody around him knew who he was and I thought that was kind of funny because That's I mean, these are project. opera people. They have their stars, and I guess everybody else has, you know, the Hollywood stars. And I and I had the parallel universes. It, it was because I was like, why why isn't he being mobbed by people? But the, he was surrounded by opera nerds. <laughs> they don't have time Which for that. He loves. I mean, he loves opera. He adores opera. Okay. And yeah. The, yeah. when I met him on that plane, you know what the movie was that they were playing on the plane? Wolverine. Uh -uh. <laughs> How so weird was I, that? Yeah. <laughs> I happened to be lucky enough to be sitting in the front of the plane with him and all the people in the back, I wanted to go, Wolverine's up here. Yeah. He's here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad that nothing happened on that plane because he'd be crying and screaming because you know, people looking at him to be the superhero. And it's like, ah, no, ah, honey, ah. he, he would have been the superhero. He would have saved, he would have carried every person out. I guarantee oh, yeah, he probably would. <laughs> he is, he is that, such a great guy. He's very and cool. Down to earth. And so I was, anyhow, I was anyhow. I was trying to be all nonchalant of, um, what did I say? I didn't say, I, I said- Mr. Jack. I, I said, uh, I said, uh, Jack, I, I just said, Jack, uh, come, come this way, you know? And I'm like, come oh on. my God, I just spoke to you, Jack. I got you, come, come here. Uh -huh. And you know, he came back there and very nice. And then I snapped that picture of the, yes, you thank you very much. So anyway, Susie, you've done so much in your career uh, since you left the hallowed walls of Lee High School. Uh, yeah, it was a long time ago, a lot has happened. A lot has happened. So, you know, I remember those first strains as my first leading lady in Sound of Music back in 19, but anyway, as my first leading lady, I remember- <laughs> Standing, standing backstage in my very first musical, okay, as a sophomore in high school. You were like 15, weren't you? I was, fifth, I was Captain uh, Von Trapp. Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I stood back there watching you sing your first lines of that musical. My day in the hills. Mm hmm. And ever since then, I've stood on the sidelines and in the audience watching you. And uh, there was, I mean, it's still that same magic. You're still that same wonderful person. And 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 I, I kid you all the time, back when we were singing at Texas Tech, we would sing for grades. Now we sing for checks and we got to have, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Both are important. Both are very much important, but that was a very formative uh, uh, time for me because I knew nothing about stagecraft or anything, you know, and I look back and I just cringe about some of the decisions I didn't make and should have made. Well, I you know, we were kids and that's what those productions yeah. are for. And They're thank important. goodness for Doug Brown and Horace Griffin who shepherded right. us along and, Definitely. and really, Definitely. I mean, I, I, it is no exaggeration to say that that experience forged what the next 45 years of my life would be. That's right. That's right. It is not an exaggeration because right. up until then, you know, I was, I was, I was singing. I was always singing. I was always doing the competitions and everything, but I was also mainly focused on piano really. Right. And yes. then sound of music happened mm -hmm. and the, the stage bug bit and clamped on hard and never let go. And mm -hmm. I, it was became very clear to me at that point that piano is nice, but my gosh, standing on your feet and being out there and being, having theater was really where it was at. Well, you know, you guys were, you guys were very, very kind to me. And, and looking back, you, you, you know, you guys maybe had a little bit more experience than I had, but uh, you guys were very, very nice to me as this, as this new kid, you know, that's, you know, a sophomore in, in high school. And, but you guys at the time just seemed so much more experienced because a couple of years at, at that age. And at, just, well, we had only done, we, we did carousel uh, right. my sophomore year, I believe, but right. I was just in the chorus and, right. and Liz, Liz Schrode Liz Lowry, Schrode. 
yeah. was the mother abbess and she got right. to sing climb every mountain and yeah. then um chris lafontaine was in yeah. it and i'm sure all these people i hope all these people are watching these concerts right. because and kurt boothman yeah. and all those people who were um who were in the cast with us and uh -huh. i just remember it being a joyous joyous time and and really uh um life-changing i really i really thought that i would have been cast as as max you know the cut up because you know there was jim lafontaine who was older right. and probably looked you know more the part except he had the california you know uh, feathered locks you know drapery hair okay. drapery hair as we all did back in the 70s yes <laughs> <laughs> but but and and of course you know uh you know doug brown prepared the the chorus of nuns and everything and of course it was beautifully it was sung, brilliant. musically it was brilliant. sung and stuff and so that was uh, that was my first few months in in high school so after after you w left lee take us through the major steps that led you to be the mezzo diva of the world oh <laughs> yeah. well hmm. um well i went to texas tech right and i was just remembering this today do you remember when gene kenny choral director extraordinaire at texas yeah. tech came to came to lee and did a, a choral workshop that's a and i'd heard of him but i i met him that year i think right right and really he sort of i think he talked to me or doug brown introduced us or something and he offered me a scholarship and that's i mean i i wasn't really ready mature enough to go very far away from home but tech right. was just right it was just far yeah. enough away and just close that, enough. That's not, that's and they I gave know. me a nice yeah they gave me a nice scholarship and uh, and so I went to Texas Tech and I was there. I stretched a four year bachelor's degree into five years because there were summer rep shows and there was always doing shows. And so I wasn't taking all the credit hours that I probably should have. So right. it took me five years to get a bachelor's. And yeah. by that time I was studying with the amazing Mary Gillis, my voice teacher. Yeah. And I wanted I wasn't ready to leave her. So I stayed on two more years for a master's degree from tech. Right. Right. So I was in Lubbock for seven long years but yeah. i loved every minute of it i loved every minute of high school and i loved every minute of college and 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 plus developing my craft and getting more and more into um the artistic expression of it and the and right. the technique and learning more about that and then at a certain point i realized i had had every job in lubbock twice i'd sung at every church and every temple and everything you could do and i was ready to go to new york yeah. because some of our friends had moved on to new york from mm -hmm. tech choir mm -hmm. and to you know to to begin their life on the world stage right. or at least try right. and so i had friends up there who uh who cushioned my arrival in addition i enrolled for another mas master's degree at, at manhattan school of music because mm -hmm. i needed the i needed the safety net of a of a school to, yes. to go up there i wasn't ready structure. to go up there just with nothing right but right. i needed so i got a scholarship to manhattan school of music and then that's when like you know the stakes were this high mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know and i here i was a little girl from texas west texas and i felt so unprepared and so underexposed to the big culture and i just kind of went in with my eyes wide open and my ears wide open and yeah. just tried to learn everything i could and i quickly had to shed this is important i had to shed a lot of my inhibitions and my my feeling like i wasn't good enough because of where i where i had come from and what i hadn't seen in my life Right. And right. there was a real turning point where um, I was in a public master class and the person famous mezzo who was giving the master class asked me to do something that was way out of my comfort zone. She asked me to jump off the stage and run up and down the aisles while singing Carabino's aria Non so più. Non so più cosa son, cosa faccio, forte fo corazon, arigaccio. And, and really embody the energy of it and, and grab people by the collar and right. tell them the story. And I thought, I can't do that. And then I thought, you don't know these people. They don't know you. You've been here two months. That's right. Make a what fool have you got yourself. to lose? Mm -hmm. Make a fool of yourself uh -huh. Uh -huh. and just go for it. And so I chose to do that. And I just put, I just, you know, threw myself into it. And sure enough, all those students who were in that hall that I was so intimidated by, then they start cheering because they're getting into it and they're seeing this hurdle that I made myself jump over and they saw themselves in my shoes and right. they were supportive of me. Right. And I tell you, every time I go on stage ever since, which has been thousands of times, mm -hmm. I think about that. Yeah. Because it was a, it was a watershed moment of 
shedding my own ambitions and being able to grasp, you know, grab the gold ring. Yes. Even though it wasn't really a gold ring, it was just getting over a little tiny hurdle, but it was life changing. So that led to getting cast as, you know, in the lead at the opera at Manhattan School of Music, which got the attention of the New York press, which ultimately got me management, which ultimately got me auditioning five times a week, which uh-huh. ultimately led to winning competitions and getting hired at small opera companies to begin with, and then yeah. bigger opera companies. And then eventually I won the Met competition, mm-hmm. which is a national uh, singing competition. Um, of kids from all over the country and they winnow it down through regional district, you know, those kinds of levels to, uh, I think there were 11 singers who won my year and I was one of them. And then that led to a Met debut. And then that just led to all over the world. And that's my life in a nutshell, Eddie Pleasant. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, kind of. But uh, it's, it's really amazing how, um, you know, you think that a, a singing career, you know, finding yourself on the stage of Carnegie Hall uh, is, is, a, is a whole planet away from where you were at like Lee or Texas Tech. It's very close. It's a bunch of little steps. It's, it's a, a bunch, bunch of little, little steps. steps. Yeah. And you yeah. just do each one. You know, I, 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 I have found myself looking at a whole year of engagements in front of me. And I think I can never make it through this year. I can't, it's just going to be too tough. But just like my daddy always said, you just put one foot in front of the other. That's right. And eventually you'll be at the top of the mountain and you'll be looking down behind you and you'll say, I climbed that mountain. But in between those successes, Sometimes you weren't the one that got picked, you know? Oh, one you know. of the things that you learn very early on in this profession is rejection. That's right. You know, I, I was, I, I never got picked for anything at, at Texas Tech. I was always overlooked. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I it's it sort of, it made me a little nervous because I thought maybe, maybe this is not meant to be for me. And right. then I went to New York and then things started happening because it was just a matter of timing and opportunity and things like that. And then I thought, oh, well, okay maybe this will work. Mm -hmm. I eventually started thinking, but even along the way, I've auditioned for a thousand things I didn't get. That's right. I've screwed up auditions. I've forgotten the words in the middle of an aria that I've sung 5,000 times twice in a row. Like I forget the words, start over, forget them in the same spot, start over again. Wow. Okay. For the San Francisco opera. Wow. And I thought, oh, that's screwed up. I'll never have an I'll never have a job there. And they didn't care. They hired me anyway because they didn't care that I forgot the words. They were impressed with everything else that I did. You know, I managed to yeah. sing it okay and then with some expression or whatever. I think that is so and that's a story that I like to tell young singers a lot because ever they're so concerned with being perfect all the time. That's right. But it's not right. about perfection, it's about what you bring of yourself, what you yes. bring from your heart. Yeah. And 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 they do, and the and the good auditioners are looking at the whole picture, not exactly or not you screwed up a you know a lyric or you know an, a, a word or two you know. So right. Uh, when did you when did you finally start getting over that you know and just kind of relaxing into the fact that you know stuff happens, you know people lose. Oh you my know. gosh, I forgot. I oh my gosh, I've had all the nightmares happen on stage. <laughs> You know, I've lost my voice on stage. I've lost my voice during a performance. Yeah. I ended up whistling the end of the scene, whistling Eddie. Wow. (laughs) In a Mozart opera. I had laryngitis. I couldn't finish. And by the end of the show, all I could do was whistle. I did not take a curtain call that day. Oh, oh man. (laughs) So, so, I mean, did you get booed or anything? Were people upset or did they know that that you were ill? They heard it coming on through the whole show. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but the funny thing is in the second act of, it was the marriage of Figaro and I was playing Carabino, the 14 year old page boy. And in the second act, he's singing this beautiful, very well-known aria. Yeah, and Mm -hmm. (laughs) thank you, Andy. That's kind (laughs) of how I sounded. No, Um, and by the end of that aria, my voice was gone. Yeah. But I'm singing it to the countess and she, her next line is, 
wow, what a beautiful voice you have. I never knew you could sing so well. That's what is supposed to be said because Carabino is supposed to sing it beautifully. Right. But it, on that day, she said in Italian, she said, bravo, che bella voce. She could hardly even say the line through snickering. <sighs> and I just wanted to die. Oh my goodness. What you learned through lots and lots of um, moments where you know, when we're singing, we're also thinking ahead to maybe what the next phrase is from mm. memory. Yep. And lots of times the next phrase might not come to you. It might, the ne that next beginning of that phrase might just pop out of your head. And what I learned is that really, if I can sort of find my Zen place, mm -hmm. it'll come back in right at exactly the right moment. Yeah. Whether it's muscle memory in my mouth and forming the actual words, right. or whether my brain stops worrying that I don't know the text and the brain flips into that place where it just starts to tell the story properly and the text yeah. comes back. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've learned that even even this to not panic if I, if I get to a, a, a moment where I'm about to forget the words or something. You know, people think that, you know, being up on stage and, you know, and you're in a beautiful gown, you might be performing on television on New Year's Eve, you know, at at, uh, at David Geffen Hall or whatever. It's all glamorous and stuff, but there's a lot of work, a lot of work that goes into getting you to that space, getting you dressed, you know, getting you up for that. And then once that is over, it's on to the next thing. Yeah, there's a, it's a lot of, of really hard work. You know, if, if, if I'm on stage, I might've started preparing that performance a year ago. Yes. A year ago, mm -hmm. not to mention all the performances that have happened between now and that, you know, and a year ago, everything that goes into it. So That's sometimes right. you're, you're singing a performance and you're preparing two or three more uh, at the same time. And, yes. and like, like the an brain, let's line. talk about full brain. Yeah, huh? definitely. It's like an assembly line. Oh, yes. You know, you're getting stuff started. Now, I remember, I, I believe it was it was Marilyn Horn that said whenever she did a, a, a role that she's done before, she starts off with a blank score. She buys a brand new score. Do you do that or do you keep your old score? Oh, no. I'm always stealing from myself. I need to, rem my score is full of notes with, with what made that work well that day. Okay, okay. You know, my Rosen Cavalier score, I performed Rosen Cavalier more than any other opera, probably over 200 performances all over the yes. world. Yeah. Um, 100 at the Met, practically, I think, mm -hmm. almost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and my, I've used the same score my whole career because there are, there are, it, it's like, it's like a roadmap. And, and sometimes if I haven't, like, if I hadn't sung it in a three or four years and I come back to it and I go, oh, this phrase feels hard. How did I do this? And then right. I can look in the score and I can go, oh, because I modified that vowel. Okay. And then I thought, I thought this, you know, I thought this way instead of that way or whatever, right, you know, I have right. vocal tricks written into my scores okay because it's, uh, let me tell you, the older you get, you're the you're singing with a different instrument it's like if you learn to play a harpsichord and mm -hmm. then suddenly you're 50 and you're playing a pipe organ yeah right and exactly. it's a, a whole different ball game <laughs> You know, what do you what do you do when things go wrong you know and uh, you just make it up and and at a certain point early in my career it was terror but now it just cracks me up it makes me laugh yeah for instance one time i was on the stage with my dear good friend paul groves mm -hmm. a tenor um, from louisiana and uh and we sang a lot we've sung a lot together in our career well we were doing damnation of faust so he was faust and i was marguerite we yep. were a love pair and I had a little, and we always, we've made a career of making each other laugh on stage. Yes. I, I, we've, I've been in, you know, um, 18th century bustier, you know, beautiful gowns with everything pushed up to here and corsets and, and he'll have like the little curly George Washington wig on. And yep. sometimes it'll be crooked. And sometimes I'll draw a discreet tattoo somewhere where only he can see it on stage <laughs> with me. And we just try and crack each other up. So this one performance in Chicago, 10 years ago, uh, we were on a set that was like um, a two-story cutaway dollhouse, you know, like the yep. front, there was no front wall, but there was a 
first story and a second story on the set. So we were up on the second story singing a love duet and I'd had a little bit of a sore throat. Mm -hmm. So I had um, my favorite flavor of Ricola lozenge yeah. in my gum right here. So I could kind yep. of sing, uh -huh. but also have a little bit of soothing yeah. lemon mint lozenge. Yeah. You know, and they're fire, bright, yeah. they're yellow. Yep. Those ones are yellow. They're, yep. they're my favorite. And so I've got this in my thing and I start say, and it's in French. So I'm singing things like, you know, mon coeur, uh, coulis, da, 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 a lot of k sound and the, uh -huh. the air of the k grabbed the <laughs> lozenge and made it go flying out of my mouth. So we're, I'm on the second floor and it, and it, so it, it arcs and it shimmers in the light as it goes down and, you know, drops 15 feet and then bounces on the floor while we're seeing this passionate love duet and I can't look at him because I want, I don't know if he saw it and if he did see it, he'll be laughing. Yes. And so I, I, I kind of, I'm singing and I kind of turned around over my shoulder to see if he saw it and he was, he was singing like this. <laughs> I thought, okay, he saw it. He saw it. <laughs> and then, so, so we talked about it and laughed about it after the show. And then for every other performance, there were little uh, wax paper wrapped recolas hidden all over the set. He, he he put them all over the set just to mess with me listen so you know, you know the things that happen we everybody thinks that opera is so you know oh we're so serious yeah no there's stuff going on up there and wisecracking and and joking and the, it's a good thing that the audience is so far away from us but the yeah. advent of tv cameras has sort of changed them. It, it does <laughs> we can't get away with nearly this it's funny because uh, even people who don't mean to be seen right. are seen, especially in concerts, because there's no orchestra pit. So in a concert, right. you're with you're standing in front of the orchestra and the audience can be five feet in front of you. That's right. I've had a guy sit on the front row and read the newspaper. They think they're in their living room. They think they can't be seen. Yeah, they're invisible. Right. They're right. invisible. But we're looking right at you. And then somebody on the front row had had binoculars <laughs> on the front row. I'm like. What do you need to see? You know? yeah, I mean, my console, my, you know, oh, my, you're looking at my fillet. What <laughs> <laughs> are you not close enough? <laughs> so anyway, so back to the hidden stories of opera. Yeah. The hidden stories of opera. Listen, um, you are known for your expertise in the French repertoire. So how does someone go from Mary Gillis's voila la salade to being, you know, real, really well known and 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 celebrated? Because you know, let me tell you, French people are extremely picky about how you speak the language. That's kind of true. You are appreciated for your contribution and and celebrated through the government. You have a a, a, a very important designation. The Legion d'Honneur, the Legion of Honor Award. Legion of Honor. Jer Jerry, Jerry Lewis and I, we both. Yes, have you and Jerry Lewis. I don't think it friend. was for his French speaking or singing, but. Probably not, um, but you know. So Well, I will say it, it, it all started. Um, I mean, you know, when you're growing up in, in choirs, you're singing in all languages. So we sang a lot of French songs and everything, but it started in earnest with Ruth Ann Griffin, who was my voice teacher. Uh, uh, I think my sophomore year, I guess, I, I decided to start studying voice officially and formally because I needed to I needed to be first year in Allstate. Yeah. And I'm not a little bit competitive or anything. So I needed to have the, the advantage of studying voice with a real voice teacher. Mm -hmm. And do you know the first song she gave me was uh, Gabrielle Fauré, Après un rêve, After a dream. Yeah. It was, and I thought, this is French. And she taught me how to say the French words and she taught me how to sing that beautiful French line. Mm -hmm. And I was hooked. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. French, and I was already playing a lot of French music. You know, I was yeah. playing a lot of Debussy and sure. and stuff like that. And I just loved sort of the the surprise idiom of the French harmonies. And I just, yeah. just that always appealed to me. And so then then you get to put then, then you get to put this language with it. And I just, I felt so elegant and I felt like, oh, I'm not in Midland anymore. Not that there's anything wrong with Midland, but yeah. it yeah. transported me to a, a very exotic feeling place. And, uh, mm -hmm. it, you know, it, it, it sparked my imagination. So then all through college, I was always, you know, 
pursuing more French songs and, and uh, arias. And then I got to New York and I, I did a whole French opera as a lead in a French opera. And then, and then I started singing French music in France and they did not throw tomatoes. So I yeah. figured I must be doing okay. The song I'd like to sing for you is one of my all-time favorites. I sing it every chance I get, so I didn't want to miss the opportunity to bring it to you tonight. It's called A Cloris, and it's by Ronaldo Hahn. It's an homage to a, a neoclassical, neo-baroque type of style, but he wrote it in the early 1900s, and it's a sparkly, sweet love song. Now you are mentoring uh, singers that probably have grown up listening to you sing, perform. I love, I love the work that I've been able to do with with young singers. Uh, about three, three or four years ago, um, I was invited to become a sort of a mentor and teacher to the Los Angeles Opera Young Artist Program, mm -hmm. and these are these are students who are out of uh, usually just out of graduate school and in that sort of in between no man's land between school and starting a career. Yep. And and now in America, thankfully over the past 20 years, a lot of young artist programs have developed in different opera companies around the country. Okay. And uh, the one that we have in LA is wonderful. And I live in LA now, so that's that's very convenient. And, it's, and I love it. I really do love the work. Um, and what I have learned is that, like we were saying a minute ago, students, um, students of opera, 
and there are probably some of you listening to this today are uh, are trained to be uh, correct yeah. and to fit into the box right and to never make a mistake and while that is in very important for that's very important for you know your your beginning training mm -hmm. the difficult part is then learning how to bend that box open and right. and allow yourself to be more expressive than perfect yeah you know i of course i i i very much uh adhere to what the composer has written in terms of dynamics and phrasing and all that kind of thing right. but you've got to put your own juice in it you've got to put your own heart in it and you've got to find the meaning that it has for you right. otherwise as i always say you can have the most beautiful voice in the world and after 30 seconds no one cares because right. unless you infuse it with with your heart and your passion mm -hmm. and your whatever is called for the whatever emotion is called for in that yes. piece no one cares Right, right. Then and it's I, then it's just nice napping music. Exactly, <laughs> and because you, you that's how you feel, and that's what you're conveying, you know. So you know why does why should anybody care? And exactly. and that, that's the difficult part of that, breaking out of getting to the artistry. You know, you you learn the languages, you learn how the vowels are formed, and and you learn, you know, the pronunciation and the diction. But I guess maybe those that, that's uh, the uh, the purpose of the Young Artist Program and that sort of thing to help you to, after you have that foundation, mm -hmm. to get to the true artistry to, right. to the place that where what I, one of my favorite Susie Graham-isms is uh, say what you mean and mean what you say. That's, that's tattooed. That's gonna be on my tombstone, I think. Yeah. As I have told so many of my students, it's, it, it's not instant. This is not American Idol. No. This is not a 15 minute career. Mm -hmm. I've been singing, how old am I? I just turned 60, okay? So I have been singing since I was 25. Uh huh. I mean, singing in the world in since the world. I was 25. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's 35 years. And for the first 10 years, it was sort of hanging on <laughs> for yeah. dear life. Sure. And then for the next five or seven years, kind of riding the wave. In a stride. And, yep. And then or, and and still going up and, yep. and learning and being exposed to great European directors and great amazing colleagues that I would just sponge everything up from. Yes. Seeing yeah. how they work and seeing how they relate with the world and with their art and mm -hmm. and the studying with them of any chance I could have. And then and then the last 10, 12 years, the last 10 years, I will say, yeah. has been just letting go and enjoying it, enjoying yeah. the ride, it's letting go of my fear and my, um, and my uh, trying to prove anything. I right. swore when I turned 50, 10 years ago, yeah. I have nothing else to prove. I can, right. I, I just enjoy, just enjoy the ride. That's why in these COVID times, yes. it has been so frustrating because we miss that synergistic energy mm -hmm. of the circular energy of, of mm -hmm. singing for people. You know, for the past year, I've done a lot of video performances and I've done a lot of, you know, yes. isolation, a lot of the, so much Zoom. Uh -huh. And um, it, just this past Christmas, just, you know, a couple, few weeks ago, I was invited here in Santa Fe to sing um, for a Santa Fe performances uh, holiday concert, which was recorded in the beautiful cathedral that we have here in downtown Santa Fe. Yes. And, and, you know, it was me and a pianist, everybody was masked except me. And, um, and I asked the organizers and the, you know, cameramen were masked and the organizers were masked and I said, can I invite two friends here? And I invited my two dearest friends here in Santa Fe to just come and sit 10 feet apart. Yeah. And the, and the feeling of singing, Oh, Holy night with pe for people that I love, just even there were two of them, Yeah. but right. it was like this connection. And I got to, I got to emote and it landed on someone. Yeah. That's right. You know, it wasn't just emoting to a camera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. That even that little thing was shockingly um, uplifting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who would have thought? I know, but... I know. Yeah, and and this thing <clears throat> has certainly had its challenges, but it certainly has uh -huh. had its, its serendipities too. You know, 
Um, yeah. Because we're in a, in a position to, you know, really bring people through this somehow through the connection of music. And even though we're suffering as well, because we're, we're in this, all in this together, it's, it's, uh, it's an extra bird to try to, you know, push through that. And, and, and you I, know, I, it has, it was so hard for me in the beginning. I felt like I'd just been kicked in the stomach and I imploded for like three months. I couldn't, I couldn't even breathe. I couldn't, I couldn't even begin to sing because when you're kicked in the solar plexus, you can't inhale right. and inhaling is a big part of singing. And so mm -hmm. I just didn't have the core energy to mm -hmm. produce any sound yeah. and the, how I got even back into any kind of uplifting feeling was uh, I, I sat down at the piano and started playing, playing my Debussy. Mm -hmm. And and that's what brought me back. And then I started singing like Carol King songs and, you know, my, my old, my old seventies standby songs, you know, just gentle, easy stuff that, that just sort of got me into out of the doldrums yes. and, you know, and then, but really the thought of, uh, well, I got to do an opera. I got to do an opera um, in October. I filmed a Jake Heggy opera called three Decembers, which is still available for streaming until the end of January. But um, I don't know when this is going to air. <laughs> Uh, this is gonna air in, in like this week. Uh, less than a week, yeah, yeah. Okay, so maybe it's anyway. It's it's uh, operasanjose.org, and I've got to film an opera now. It was all it was all you know with pl pl plexiglass shields and everybody masked except the three singers, only three singers in the cast. Right. But it was it was oh my gosh, so cathartic because the act of singing mm -hmm. is I I always say just it's just controlled wailing. Mm -hmm. and and the 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 engagement of the physicality of the of the diaphragm and all the muscles that go into you know making big sound big operatic mm -hmm. sound mm -hmm. was so cathartic for me emotionally yeah and i mean the three of us I, I play i play a dysfunctional mother and my two dysfunctional grown children and that's that's the story it's called mm -hmm. three decembers by jake heggy and 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 the three of us were just like this is crazy what's happening. We were exhausted because we hadn't, you know, we hadn't spent eight hours a day rehearsing in many, many months. In many months. But the, but the outpouring of all this, this emotion that had been rising up in all of us, the frustration and the anger and the sadness yeah. that, and the de deprivation that had yeah. been up to here was choking all of us, mm -hmm. got its voice and it got to come out. And that it was incredibly healing yes. for all of us. It was yeah. really, it was so cool. And so, you know, you, you've had a very busy career. It's, it's a lot of flying and a lot of, you know, strange hotels and beds and, and, and you're hardly ever home. And it's like, I remember a story of you having to have your doorman zip you up as you run out the door to, you know, to, you know, go sing at Lincoln Center or something like that. Yes. There, yes. Might, be, there might be some people that, that, feel that you've like missed something because you, you didn't get married until much later, you didn't have children, but it seems that your whole life has come full circle with a husband and, and you, you're a, a stepmom or I call her, I, I, instead of stepmother sounds so evil, uh, I would think a, a, bonus mother, mom. a mother in love or a, a bonus, a bonus mom. Bonus mom. Yeah. What is, what is that like to be a, a, a bonus mom and a wife and, and all of this after kind of living on your own for so long? Well, I'll tell you, there's something to that old dogs and new tricks thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Clay, Clay and I have both spent our lives traveling around the world. He used to do uh, lighting for rock and roll tours. So he was yeah. with, you know, Michael Jackson and Bon Jovi and Janet Jackson and Mariah Carey, every big star you can think of, he toured the world with them. So he, he's no stranger to travel himself. And yeah. as, as a, as a gypsy, you, uh, you, you, you become very self-sufficient yeah. and you, you learn how to cook in a hotel room. Mm. <laughs> you know, you learn how to survive on the road without right. the comforts of home. You just improvise and it's all okay. And you have only yourself to look after and mm -hmm. you get very okay with dining alone in a restaurant in a foreign country. Mm -hmm. And that all becomes sort of okay. You get yep. used to it. And yep. then, and then at 56, you get married to someone I've known him for 30 years, you know, we, we knew each other at Texas tech. So, um, so we were, you know, we've always been great friends 
and we're both extremely tolerant and we're not, you know, who else would have wanted to marry me? Because, you know, most people want a wife who's actually home. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I actually dated people during my life that, that sure. said, you know, it's great, but you're just gone too much. And I was like, uh -huh. okay. okay, see you. Yeah. Bye-bye. Yeah. Okay. And I also had lots of friends who, uh, who married and had young children early on in mm -hmm. our careers. And, right. and I saw the, the way that they were tugged between motherhood and building these big careers. Mm -hmm. And, and it was never easy. And there were always nannies on the road with them. Right. And it was always, you know, uprooting your children and putting them in foreign schools while you're in Paris and putting them in a German school when you're in Munich or Berlin. And it, it was just that I, I could not have managed motherhood in that way. And so I chose to not, not have children. Right. Um, because I, because my life was firmly established and I loved the way it was. And I didn't, I didn't want to subject, I kind of didn't want to subject anybody else to, I didn't want to force my life on them. Yes. I, and I, I didn't want to give up the life that I had. You know this, you know this about me because we've had a hundred conversations about this, but everybody who's listening might not know this. Mm -hmm. Deep down, I'm still a girl from Midland who is astonished yeah. by what has happened in my life in the past 40 years. Yes. 42 years since I left Midland. Mm -hmm. I could never, I could never have dreamed of getting paid to sing. The mm -hmm. first time I didn't have to pay for the privilege of singing. <laughs> yes. And you know that well. Yeah. <laughs> I was amazed. And, 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 and then when I look back on the, oh my gosh, the places I've been and the people I've met and the opportunities yes. has been extraordinary. And you know, every time you come backstage to see me anywhere, whether it's Salzburg or the Met or whatever, we, we both, we always just look at each other and go. Look at this. This is amazing. <laughs> you know, this is crazy. You know, right. I'll tell you a, fun, a, a funny story along those lines. One time I was singing in Paris and it was when the United States was just coming back into UNESCO, uh -huh. the UNESCO community. And it was when George Bush was president and Laura was coming over to Paris to oversee the, uh, the, ceremony to bring the United States back into UNESCO. The headquarters were in Paris and I happened to be in Paris. We happened to know each other because I happened to have sung at his inauguration, which is where in your honor, I got this United States Marine Corps coffee cup because the Marine Corps band of course played at the inauguration. That's where I got yes, I know. And it, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. That's funny. Yeah. Those of you who can't see that's the inaugural program that I gave to Eddie. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyhow, so Laura Bush, I was asked, to, they asked me to sing the national anthem at this ceremony at the UNESCO headquarters with all of these beautiful flags in a semicircle like the UN, you know. Yeah. yeah. And we're sitting there, we're standing there and the ceremony's going on and it's just about time for me to sing. And of course I'm humming, humming my F because that's the only key I can sing it. And it has to start on the F because it has to be in B flat because if you got to go up to the high b flat at the end okay. anyway so i'm going uh -huh. keeping my f right. in my ear and laura bush looks at me she's standing right here she's got this poem. she yep. looks at me and she says she says well susie who to thunk it two little girls from midland standing here in paris france that's right i, you and know I was what? like If you go into the world with respect, generosity, and humility, no matter what your profession is, you will survive and do and very well. I, th uh -huh. I think survive Indeed. and thrive. Exactly. Because all those three traits are, are really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now, I think those of us who were raised in West Texas are lucky to, to have seen that in action. And it was shown to us. Yes. Um, the uh, I, we would be remiss not to mention Doug Brown, exactly in this yep. discussion because he was our choir director and and he uh, he was our angel. He yep. was he was our angel who we carry with us even now, even though he's still very much on earth. He got in our hearts and he taught us that music is heart. Yes, it's not just notes and not just sound, but mm -hmm. it's heart. Mm -hmm. And, and that is something that, that I think we've all carried with us. I really do.
It is true. And you know, at the time, we knew we were getting good educations. I mean, before we got to leave, you know, the Corral was a storied program and you wanted to be a part of it. It had all these great students in it that we looked up to and we were yeah. in it and then move on. But mm -hmm. it's true. All of the, that foundational uh, formation that we got at Lee and then later on at Texas Tech with regard to how to walk into a room with energy, how to announce your aria and announce a composer or whatever, that stuff stays with you. Yeah, it does. I've gotten jobs because I could sight read, you know? Yeah. You've probably gotten jobs in business because you could walk in and present yourself. This is right. This, this is true. Mm -hmm. It all just kind of works. Uh, it's it all works of together. a piece. It is, yeah. it is. It's not just, you know, we were fortunate that we could, you know, translate what we learned in, in music and, and all of that training directly into what we did, but it's all a part of it. And, you know, you have to give interviews on television. You have to, you know, do videos. You have to, you know, go to for, foreign countries and all of that stuff. That, that's all Midland. That's all Midland, <laughs> you know. Carol Hall, thrusting us in Carol front of people. Hall. All we the different, you, you know, the uh all the different uh, uh uh civic groups that we were thrust in front of and all of that we were getting our chops and we didn't even realize it. no you're absolutely right and singing an origin i think about you know does origin still exist i don't know they, they are alive and well that's fantastic well we were of course kind of a disco singing group back in the 70s when I was in it. And we were, uh, we sang it at school dances, we sang at school events. And we were, I, I was the one who was writing four part harmony of to Doobie Brothers songs. And I was playing the piano and singing the alto line. We had guitar and drums uh -huh. and Liz, Liz Schrode on the tambourine. Yes, and we were out there winging it and, and all that. And, and, and Gala, Gala maybe. Gala, Gala niece maybe, yeah. Oh, yes. And Donnie yeah. Roberts. Oh, it, gosh, yes. it was amazing. It, it was amazing. And now that I'm an older person, <laughs> I, I, not. I love seeing young people being positive because at the time we were told that when we performed for these civic groups, the Lions Club and Kiwanis and all of that, they need to know that after they move on and move up, that the country is going to be in good hands of the youth. Who said that to you? <laughs> or did you just figure that out? I figured it out. And that's well, what I tell gosh, the kids. You were, thinking, I said, you were thinking on a much higher plane than I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what are the words? I don't forget the steps. Yeah, what are the words to, uh, you know, a junk food junkie? He's on down, he's on down the road. <laughs> you know, oh, oh, they love me. Yes. Oh, I, I hope Liz Schrode watches this. She you know, her brother's a big old judge now. I know. I saw yeah, it that was Mr. pretty County. funny. So anyway, any any last words that you might have to our audience and particularly our students at at Lee, particularly the the Lee Corral, the current Corral uh, at Lee High School. I just have to I just have to say that I stand in awe of your energy and resourcefulness and resilience through this really unprecedented and ridiculous time of mm -hmm. how you guys have I've my my stepchildren are twins and they're fresh in high school and you know they've never been inside their high school so they're doing it all online yeah. and um and i know that you guys have had your struggles and i i'm glad that you can actually have some opportunity to sing together because as a choir that's kind of important yeah but uh i i can't wait until we can all you know get throw our masks away yes. throwing it away yeah and and <laughs> And you know, be safe and and go back to communing with one another because the communion of of music is is life sustaining for everybody, whether you're a performer or not. It is. If it you're is. doing it and you love doing it and it brings you joy, it's it's it is life sustaining. It is life. And so I, and I want you all to know that whether, like Eddie said, whether or not you go on to have a, a career in music or not. What you're learning now, the way that you're learning to uh, to join with others for in a common goal, and the way that you you have to listen and you have to blend and you have to put yourself not forward but be part of a group, mm -hmm. and and always you know have the discipline on this side, and the love on this side, and those things meet in the middle, and then you're you're making art happen, 
And if you can carry that feeling and that joy and that feeling of connecting with other people with you, mm -hmm. then all of this, all of this work and training that you've done to be in a top notch corral like you are, mm -hmm. um, with, regardless of what, whichever course you're in, it is, you know, it's important and you'll, you will carry it with you for your whole life for and it will bring joy forever. Oh my Susan Graham, Susie Graham, my, my Fraulein Maria. Thank you so much for uh, spending some time with me. It's been great to uh, catch up and, uh, and it was so fun. fun to have all these people kind of eavesdropping on, on our conversation. I, hope they I know. I feel, like, I feel like we're just like hanging out and all these people are watching. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, that that's us. And, and, and believe me, no matter where it is that, that you are, you are singing, I always just see Susie and I'm always so proud. I'm glad. Will you take All care? Right. Of Lots of love to everybody. Let, let's not wait too long before we talk again, okay? Okie dokie. All right. Mwah. Bye. Bye. <laughs> thank you, Susie, for taking the time to speak with me. It was a lot of fun. And thank you for sharing your wonderful talent with us. You are a great example of the places one can go. Yes, even from Midland, Texas, where the sky is the limit. On behalf of our production team, Paula Edwards, Karen Blackstone, Josh Cooley, and yours truly, along with the Alumni Corral committee members, all of our performers, the current LHS choirs directed by Dr. Guadalupe Rivera and Ms. Laurie Alfred Wash, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for making this effort to come together in spite of the limitations of this difficult time a success. We especially thank you, our donors, for without you, our mission would truly be impossible. Our lives have been forever enriched because of our time in the choirs of Lee High School. Let's encourage the future music teachers and performers, shall we? and donate to the LHS Alumni Chorale Music Scholarship. Feel free to watch this and all your favorite installments again and share the links with family and friends. Watch for updates throughout the year regarding our future plans for an in-person reunion and scholarship concert. We all long for the day that we can truly sing together again. On a personal note, it has been my honor to host these concerts. The choral program at Lee will always hold a special place in my heart. Thanks for watching, and remember, no matter the situation, always find a way to sing on.